If you are brand new to us this morning, welcome, welcome, welcome to Crossroads Church Denver. We have some cards out in the lobby that gives you a little bit of information about our church. And we also have lunch immediately following service. And that's for everybody. But if you are new among us this morning, we are so glad you are here. We've made a few changes in how the lobby looks these days. The, um, the volunteer signups, the kiosk, and the welcoming center has now shifted into this little section right by the stairs going up. So if you're looking for the kiosk to make a donation, if you are looking for information on our various volunteer ministries and how you can get involved or anything else, that will be the place to do it. Also, on October 16th, if you will mark your calendars, we have our next town hall meeting immediately following church. Finally, before we get to the offering, which is all about generosity, both our generosity to God and the generosity of the church to the community, I want to say a special thanks to a group of people that showed up here bright and early yesterday morning and we took a very full overstuffed maintenance shop and it is now empty except for two trailers and a roll-off dumpster and the roll-off dumpster is leaving on Tuesday and the floors have been swept so and that only took these guys just a few hours and it was amazing anyway ushers if you'll come forward Father, we thank you for how you richly bless us each and every day. We thank you for all the gifts you put in our life and how you take care of us. We thank you now, Lord, for the opportunity to worship you through both our tithes and our offerings. And we ask, Lord, that you bless both the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, amen. At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts, and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all. It's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits Welcome indeed to, somebody had a good idea with back to church Sunday, it's the right time of year to get settled in. We started a series, it's going to be a brief one, but it's um, always important from time to time to come back to a book study. Now it's always a challenge because the majority of Christians don't come every week, which is another rabbit trail that I won't take this morning. So to keep up with uh, an overview of a particular book, 
Um, you know, you need to sometimes do your homework and kind of keep caught up with us. Speaking of which, I have a text I want to go to that I hadn't turned to. So forget that homework thing. Okay. Now, remember the setup for this week largely depends on last week when we talked about the reason why Paul talks so much about unity, talks so much about diversity, and talks so much about everybody getting along and behaving themselves. And that is because starting with the um, day of Pentecost, diversity was an issue within the church. And we talk about the number of people represented um, in Jerusalem, which was always overcrowded during the Feast of Pentecost. And so the great first miracle of the gift of tongues was people hearing the gospel in their own language. And we talked about the necessity of that, but that set up the challenge of diversity. People coming from different uh, nationalities, different languages. <clears throat> we talked about the beginnings of that being the curse of the Tower of Babel. Remember, they were using their unity to build a big tower and act like gods. That was a curse. We explained that Jesus came to reverse the curse of sin. And so one of the, the first things he did was reverse one of the great curses upon mankind, which was everybody was divided. It was time to come back together. You know, out of necessity, he divided people into different cultures, languages, nationality, and now it was time for that to be reversed. And from then on, the church would be a place for everybody. Amen. That's why I like that video so much. The church is supposed to be for everybody. It doesn't matter the, the culture, the nationality, the color, ethnicity, ethnicity. It doesn't matter. Now, some places do better at that than others. But I will tell you, it needs to be an intentional uh, part of the church's ministry philosophy because that's what Jesus did, is bring people together. And so when he said to the disciples, go into all the world, that was the foundation. You get it? They were primed for different cultures. They were primed for different languages. And so as a result, Thomas went to India. Paul went all over the place, Did never made it to Spain, but that's where he was headed. And the stories of the, the other disciples that went to different places. Peter ending up uh, in Rome as well as uh, Paul. And so this is why there's this, and I, I use this term all the time because people interpret all these niceties about unity as some kind of Hallmark card mentality. Well, he just wants everybody to be like super nice to everybody. You know. He just wants everybody to behave and to like each other. No, it was an absolute <clears throat> necessity for the furtherance of the church for them to understand that the diversity thing was important and intentional from the very day of Pentecost. That is by way of review. And so we begin in uh, verse 14 of Philippians 2. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless. Children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now, this would have been a challenge in and of it by itself because separate nations were a threat to the Roman Empire. They conquered most of the known world, and they had to keep control of them. 
one of the reasons why they kept such an eye on the, on the Jews is that they were prone to rebel because of their identity. And so it was a difficult thing. Now, where did the deacons come from in Acts 6? Complaining. There was a problem with the Greek widows. They were being treated unfairly. And one of the first things that the early church had to fix was that prejudice, that problem of, of, of being discriminatory toward the Greek widows. We're Jews. Couldn't be prouder if you can't hear us. We'll yell a little louder. You Greek widows, not so important as our people. And so this would over and over again sneak into the church because it was a natural part of every culture. If you look at the Old Testament, all the wars between the city-states and small nations and you know, fighting for territory and killing each other off and all this kind of thing. Well, all that was to be over with in Christ. And so this is why you see him bringing this up again and again. You're in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Well, they were, was the Roman Empire. And we could do a litany of all the immoral uh, practices of the Romans and the Colosseum and the feeding people to lions and the gladiators and all of this immoral uh, attitude and practice that was assigned to them. And they were to become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked, perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. They were not to, to, to rise up and go to war. That's not the kind of Messiah Jesus was. In verse 16, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Now this was a threat to somebody like Paul because he was a hard worker. The traveling that he did was difficult. It was on foot, not by a transporter from Star Trek. He packed it up and walked. And I think that as you see some of his other letters, particularly to uh, Timothy and to Titus, uh, toward the end of his ministry, he was, he was, it was very important to, him, important to him. He paid a lot of attention to the unity of the church because it was so fragile and could have been undone easily. And why are complaining and arguing so harmful? Why in the world will Paul bring it up over and over and over again? Because it was counterproductive to one of the purposes of Christ, which was to bring people together out from the curse of separatism. If all people know about a church is that its members are constantly arguing, constantly complaining, and constantly gossiping, they get a false impression of Jesus and the gospel. No one wants to come to a place like that. When I was still a teenager, I was a Methodist, and they would have a night of the month where the committees would meet now, there was a committee for everything. If you come from a denominational background, you know that there was a committee for everything, a committee to choose the carpet color, you know, a committee to make this decision or that decision or what color the choir robes were going to be. And I re still remember walking up and down the hall and listening to through the door to the different committee, and they were always arguing. There was no such thing as a silent door. When it was committee night every month, you kind of wanted to stay away. Because it sounded like to me, I was like 17, and it sounded like to me a whole lot of people that would just as soon kill each other to make their point. 
Now, to be real honest, folks, I'm not sure that that condition has improved. It might not be called a committee, but people will sometimes gather around an issue and complain and argue about it. And that kind of behavior defies the unifying power of Jesus Christ. Now, this is a major doctrine. Now, a lot of, th uh, a lot of times when you're studying major doctrine, it doesn't show up as a chapter in Galatians or Romans or anywhere else. Much of major doctrine re requires a topical study throughout the scripture to get the thread of teaching from the Old Testament, its changes in the New Testament, and what your final conclusion and goals are. And so his, his point is not just to everybody get along. His point is stop arguing with other Christians or complaining about people and conditions within the church and let the world see Jesus instead. And he understood, as we talked about last week, the diversity in the church of Philippi. There wasn't a church he started that didn't have such diversity and difference in philosophy. And if you read the New Testament with that in mind, the different philosophies in Greece, the different moralities or lack thereof amongst the Roman Empire... And so it's important that people change their perspective on the lives of other people. And change is hard. As I've said about 25 times, the only people that like change are babies. <laughs> but God will orchestrate it. He will. And in Jeremiah 48, I don't have this on the board, so you're going to have to pay attention. In verse 11, he's speaking of Moab. And these, this group of people, of Israelites, it says, Moab has been at ease from his youth. He has settled on his dregs. And he has not been emptied from vessel to vessel. Nor has he gone into captivity. They learned a lot of lessons in captivity. Therefore, his taste remained empty in him Blech. and his scent his smell has not changed therefore behold the days are coming says the Lord that I'll send him uh, send him the wine workers who will tip him over and empty his vessels now this would have been culturally um, redeemable almost instantly. We don't necessarily understand it. But when they harvested the grapes to make wine, they would, of course, stomp the grapes into juice. But they didn't strain out the, the, the rest of it, the skins. They would pour it into a, a, a barrel, a container, a vessel, of some kind and then set it aside because the dregs would always sink to the bottom. And after they sunk to the bottom, they'd scoop out the bottom layer with the grape skins and the bitter stuff and the stems that remained and, and all that kind of stuff. Have you ever accidentally chewed on the stem of a grape? Lovely, sweet grape, and then you bite into the stem and you go, yeah. What happened? Who poisoned my grape? Well, they had to get all that stuff out of there. What many people don't know is it was poured from vessel to vessel until clear. Well, how many times is that? What well, was until clear? Well, is that six times, seven times? Until clear. Everybody's different. But you don't want to sit in your own smell. And God will change you because the way you are and the people you identify, the peer group that you're in, 
is probably going to change or at the very least be adjusted. And there are many talents and many things that you will bring into your faith in Christ. I often think about the town. Most of the guys on this stage uh, started playing music before they were Christians. I was nine years old when I started playing piano. And by the way, I want to welcome one of my best friends, Bo McDougall. Um, he just relocated to town, and um, we played for years uh, in the same band together. And it's just really good to have him here. Amen. Why don't you just say, say thanks? So you'll 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 see a more more of his of Bo if we could just get his brother Al here, who's a great drummer and percussionist. I tell you what, my my cup runneth over. <laughs> From vessel to vessel until clear. Now, a transformed life is a witness, is an example of God's word. And Paul uses the idea of us shining brightly. Not a, a, a new concept or a new metaphor. You know, we're a city set on a hill. We're not to put a bushel basket over the, the flame. And there is a working in your life that allows you to be seen, hopefully, as different. Because in the perverse generation that the early church started, it was the only way to be differentiated. Everybody else was about the business of killing each other. And Rome crucifying and otherwise bringing great harm to people. Now, as most of you know, who are not just uh, minor students of the Bible, you, you know that, that Paul considered himself a sacrifice. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and the service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Now, he is defining what was known as a drink offering. It was part of one of the rituals that um, surrounded uh, uh, many of the feasts and the gatherings, and it consisted of wine uh, poured around the altar. The first is Numbers, the next is Exodus, joined with meat offerings in Numbers in several places, presented daily and on the Sabbath and on the feast days. One, one fourth of a portion of wine was required for one lamb, one third for a ram, one half of a bullock, and it was part of the, the law of Moses, and basically it was a liturgy. You know, we have a liturgy here. You know, we start with prayer and we worship and we throw in those pesky announcements, right? And we study the Word of God and we hope to apply it personally. That's a liturgy. And I've poured my life into it. And so Paul is, is saying he's like a drink offering. He's, he's poured himself out for these people. So he regards his life as a sacrifice. And he asks others to do also, like in uh, Romans 12. Present yourself as a living sacrifice. So Paul's attitude was even if he had to die, um, he knew that he had helped the Philippians live for Jesus, as has already been stated. To live as Christ, to die as gain. But he was very interested in fruit that remained. And when you are totally committed to serving the Lord, sacrificing to build the faith of others is a serious thing, and it's a serious commitment. Now, verse 19, he gets a little dark. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded 
who will sincerely care for your state. He didn't have a pack of disciples. Now you might think, well, Jesus had 12 minus 1. That's a lot of committed guys to go into all the world preaching and teaching. For some reason, with Paul's level of sacrificial attitude, he didn't have a lot of people, you know, taking a number to line up to join him. No one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. Now, Timothy was with Paul every time you turned around. He was in Rome when Paul wrote this letter. He traveled with Paul on his second missionary journey, was with him at, uh, at Philippi when the jailer was converted. And finding young people, particularly young men, to raise up for ministry has been a commitment of mine for many, many years. But, as my granny used to say, they're as rare as hen's teeth. Well, you kind of got to upgrade that because most people don't know about chickens to know that hens don't have teeth. But it's about as rare as finding a nutritionist eating at McDonald's. <laughs> it's that rare. They're just hard to find. And he gives a reason for it. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. Now, that, to me, that sounds like an indictment. Everybody's out for their own thing, he says. He observes that most believers are too preoccupied with their own needs to spend time working for the Lord. Now, we can't complain too much about that because... This is Paul the Apostle saying, I got this problem too. Schedule, concerns, often crowd out the idea of Christian service. The inconvenience of loving the unlovely. Do you know not everybody is easy to love? There are some that are just downright, it seems downright impossible to love. It's like, I love you. No, I don't. <laughs> so I'll, I'll pretend if that's okay with you. They're hard to find. And, you know, I, I keep that, but, I mean, I, I, I get that, that, that keeping to yourself. Um, and this was a problem. But, you know, servants have to come from somewhere. You know, oftentimes people will ask, why was Jesus so violent with Saul before he became Paul? He's confronted by the power of God. He's apparently knocked off his horse, struck blind, and hauled away to listen to a prophet and listen to the words of Jesus. Now, who responds to that kind of altar call voluntarily? <laughs> Come forward and be knocked down and struck blind. Oh, me first, me first. It, uh, but I, I think the reason Jesus did that, it was probably the only way he could recruit Paul because he was so stubborn. He was so committed to persecuting Christians that it almost took that, that kind of, of radical conversion that he would talk about over and over again because he interpreted it as an act of grace. But you know his proven character that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Now he's back talking about Timothy. Now, just as a skilled workman trains an apprentice Paul was preparing Timothy to carry on his ministry. And if you were thinking about taking Paul's place, you had to be pretty tough. One of my mentors from the past reminded me, and I could get this because I had horses at the time, and 
and he talked about mules. And he said, the only way you teach a young mule is to um, hook it up, team it up with an older experienced mule, and the experienced mule will keep them in line. He has to go where the experienced mule goes. The, the young mule has to do what is told. It has to respond to the reins, whether he goes left, right, or straight. He has to, to, to respond to the calls for what speed to go, whether a walk, a trot, or perhaps a canter. And so for the young mule, he, they're, they're, he can't get away with anything. He's strapped in. Timothy was strapped in. He was in harness. And I think that that was more a voluntary thing than I'm not going to take the mule thing any farther. But it is, it is a... Um, a training uh, style and philosophy. Now, even the Apostle Paul, I think, had a lot to learn. You know, he had kind of a disappointing experience with John Mark um, when they were headed off to minister. And there was a, this is a whole other Bible study in and of itself, but there was a sharp contention between Barnabas and Paul over John Mark. Now remember, Barnabas' gift was primarily encouraging. Paul was an apostle and an evangelist. He was a warrior. And I think John Mark was a little more timid, perhaps. And there are lots of different personalities and lots of diversities of ministries, correct? And you've got to be kind of broad-minded uh, broad to understand that. There are simply differences. And, and one of the problems with the diversity thing is people don't like differences. You're different than me. So what? This is who I am. You deal with it. That was Paul's attitude. Barnabas disagreed with Paul because Paul didn't want to take John Mark any further into the mission field. So this contention led to a divide. And what you ended up with is two missionary journeys instead of one. Now later, after John Mark had proved himself, they were re reunited again. But I think Paul's intense personality was a little much for John Mark to handle. It could... Uh, easily have created excuse me the same kind of problem as Paul but I think that Paul learned some patience from his old friend Barnabas and as a result Timothy became a son to Paul you see everybody's learning Paul's learning John Marcus learning to be tougher Barnabas is learning that there are differences in personalities and, and gifts. Timothy had a strong background, Jewish training in the scriptures from his mother and his grandmother. Um, by Paul's second visit, Timothy had turned into um, a respected disciple. And when it came time for him to go, it was time for him to go back to Philippi and then at Ephesus. And you've got to study the book of Acts to really put it all together. But I'll read this to you. Timothy's mixed Greek-Jewish background could have created problems on their missionary journeys because many of their audiences would be made up of Jews who were concerned about the uh, strict keeping of tradition. Timothy's submission to the right of circumcision helped to avoid that potential problem. There's lots of arguments about why Paul made him do that. But it was, guess what? A sacrifice. If that's not a sacrifice 
for a full grown man, it'll do till sacrifice comes along. <laughs> but he was that committed to unifying the diversity. Now, one of my points is, folks, we have to be more committed to diversity. We've got what we like and the people we like, and you know, us four no more. And it just goes along with the culture. It's the way you live. How many generations did the world live after the Tower of Babel? Well, many, 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 many generations. So it was, it was in the DNA of their social thinking, in the DNA of their cultural thinking. But it wasn't in Jesus. He came to reach the world, the whole world. And what Paul was dealing with is people fighting about their, their tensions and their differences and their mixed racial background. And they struggled with how young Timothy was. They, were, they, they discriminated against everybody and everything. So in this particular case, it was age discrimination. He's too young. Now it's rampant in our society is age discrimination for old people. Well, they're no good anymore. You know, it's okay. It's been going on since the times that we're talking about right now. So Timothy was available to send to Corinth. And our last pictures of Timothy are found in the New Testament, in First and Second Timothy, if you want to do some homework, you'll see this personalized communication that Paul uh, exercises because Timothy truly was a spiritual son. Now, Paul was aging and nearing death when he wrote to Timothy and Titus but he still had a burning desire to continue his mission. The mission of Jesus had not dimmed with age for him. And Timothy was one of his hopes. So Paul's writing to one of his closest friends. They traveled, suffered, cried, laughed together. And he is, as we started this study, they, they've shared the joy of seeking, of seeing, excuse me, people respond to the gospel. I think one of the biggest responsibilities that shows kind of a point of graduation is when Paul, who had been in Ephesus for upwards of three years. It was the longest he stayed anywhere. He stayed 18 months in Corinth and left leadership and developed the leadership of Priscilla and Aquila and others. But Ephesus was really important to him. And the scene saying goodbye to the elders of Ephesus is a very telling thing, and I think that one of the most rewarding things in the world for Paul was to have someone carry on his mission. I still am thrilled when I see young men and women who are responding not to me, not to my training, not to my, not my discipleship. You know, when people say, well, I'm discipling who, and and they're being discipled by. And I, I always like to correct them a little bit and say, you know, Jesus hadn't stopped discipling. You didn't somehow take his place. He's still calling. He's still confirming. He's still sending. And I think as Paul looked at, at Timothy and left him in, in his beloved Ephesus, he must have been just filled with joy. And so every time, every time uh, I hear of 
and I don't always know everything or everybody. But when I travel, I, there, I can't tell you, there's hardly a day that goes by when I'm traveling and somebody doesn't come up to me and say, I was saved coming out of your ministry. Now I'm in South Carolina. Now, or like what Dave Boyd said, David Boyd, that he ends up with 12 year, in 12 years in Vienna. I did not know that until he said it last week. And I, th I thought, man, that looked good on my record, except it's not my record, is it? It's the record of Jesus. I didn't know that. But that's the kind of thing that happens all the time. And I got to, I've got to tell you, when, when people get serious and they break through that barrier, I have no one to send. It's one of the most satisfying times of, of a pastor's life to hear that someone you've prayed with or someone you've trained or someone you've influenced is now prepared to go lead worship halfway around the world. Because we've been kind of a clearinghouse for worship leaders for as many years as we've been training gifted men and women. And so this is a very personal time for Paul, and it, and it shows us his commitment to seeing this process where, where people become otherly. And boy, it's tough. Because we're, we're, we're used to being members of the Tower of Babel. We got our ways and our place and the people we like and the things that we don't like and the people we don't like. And Jesus says, I don't really care what you think. You're a product of a curse. And I'm here to break that curse and the attitude that goes along with it. The church was diverse then. It needs to be diverse now. And Paul finally had a few people that were like-minded that he could send to these strange places. You know how weird Corinth was? Mariel has been teaching this in the women's Bible study. Do you know how bizarre that, that city was? There are crazy people that live there. <laughs> Only somebody called would go to, to, to Corinth. Oh, oh, you know, only somebody half crazy in Christ would even dare to think to walk into a city with that many problems and that much immorality and, and temple prostitutes and, and this and that and the other. And, all. and here comes Paul. <laughs> Anybody want to join me? Yo, Priscilla, Aquila, I got this mission. You want to come with me? And so that's really the purpose for the, the intimacy of this particular message. And my prayer is that as we continue to go through uh, the rest of Philippians, which is equally intimate, that we would see. See, this, this was never meant to be, as I said in the introduction, Philippians was never meant to be dispersed. Not like Ephesus, the letter, letter to the Ephesians was meant to be circulated. This got circulated as an afterthought by the people who found it. And it is, along with First and Second Timothy, some of the most personal, intimate messages that you can personally apply to yourself. This is something that you decide. My level of commitment to serve the Lord. Your willingness to do whatever he tells you to do. It's negotiated somewhere when you're by yourself with God. Because it's not about me. It's not about anybody else. If you make a decision, for instance, as some people do, do, do to go deep in the mission field because someone has cheered you on, Oh, don't do that. May it come like, like Paul, where you know 
that he is serious enough to communicate to you, serious enough to convert you to a point you will never forget it. So when you say, here am I, Lord, send me, you probably ought to better mean it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the example of Paul. We thank you for his ups and downs. And it's such a perfect example of how human beings often struggle with the enemy, with the culture, with the social values. But we know, Lord, that go ye into all the world cannot be changed or edited. And we ask, Lord, for this message to reach our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.